for this dreary purple season of Lent to have heavy boulders of scripture like these that we heard today to read. But all things considered, I thought it would be a whole lot more fun to just get up here and to say, you know, and now brothers, won't you join me in singing Wipeout once again? <laughs> it was very fun last night. But Lent is a different sort of time, a time when the Spirit drives us, as it did Jesus, out into the wilderness with the hope that we could somehow find God in that arid place, in that darkness. We are tempted, though, to resist the Spirit's call. I know I am myself. I was so distracted from writing this bleak sermon yesterday by the glorious good weather. And there was this wonderful color magazine ad that distracted me on the back of a magazine across the room. This barefoot couple, rosy sunset, a white powdery beach, and a headline that said, Grand Cayman Islands. Ah, yes. That was the path I would have preferred to walk. But Jesus calls us on a different way, along a more rocky shore, in the way of the cross. It's not an easy message to go out there and tell your friends about. Who in their right mind would want to join us on that path? Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus cried that out. What we may not know is that <clears throat> these words were essentially the title of what we now know as Psalm 22, before it was numbered as it is today. Scholars have guessed that Jesus might have actually sung the entire psalm from the cross much as those last passengers on the Titanic united their voices, legend has it, in nearer my God to thee as the great ship went down. Even Jesus experienced this moment that many of us have, this dark night of the soul. And yet he still clung to his faith to the words that his parents and grandparents knew passed down to him, the words of the psalmist, and he shouted them out. Even at that moment when God appeared to him the most conspicuously absent and silent. None of us wants to go there. So we can understand why the disciples of Jesus would have wished for a less painful outcome for their good friend. I'm sure we could easily identify with Peter in Mark's gospel lesson, his, his good intentions of trying to buck up Jesus, you know? Get him to talk him out of this dread prediction that his ministry, his great and wonderful ministry, this amazing teacher, it was going to end in a bloody death on the cross. You know, we have the benefit of 2020 hindsight of, on Easter day, so we can hear this scripture and be cheerful and optimistic. We hear Jesus proclaiming what would be the life-bringing spiritual success of resurrection and not the resounding worldly failure of execution by the Romans. We can see why Peter wouldn't want his friend to go into that kind of downward spiral of negative thinking. What good would it do? But Jesus rebukes Peter, we hear. Jesus points toward the cross, and not just for himself, 
but for Peter and the rest of the disciples. Jesus says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. These words are a mystery in a way. We're inclined to think, and sometimes churches have taught, that somehow Jesus glorifies suffering, that a good Christian seeks out suffering for suffering's sake. It's no wonder that Christianity is rejected by so many people as being too negative, even masochistic or self-destructive. It seems to be an unpleasant truth, this way of the cross, but I do believe it is truth. The way of the life of Jesus is the way of the cross. What these scriptures remind us is that life is full of suffering and finally death. But God hears us. That's the important truth. God somehow mysteriously draws even nearer to us at those times when we are most desperate and crying out. We've experienced, many of us, how living in denial or avoidance of our pain is simply a lie. I know working with teenagers over the years, that's the brick wall that they often come crashing up against, thanks to us, with our wonderful, cheerful, happy Sunday schools. One day, our kids crash up against the wall of something really mean and hateful or evil. And they know that happy church is just a lie. It's a lie that does not lead to what Jesus called fullness of life. Jesus teaches us to set our faces toward the cross and to move toward those things that frighten us with courage. That's really what our Lenten study book is about, the shack, as the narrator Mac encounters God after the tragic death of his daughter. Jesus teaches us to pour out our hearts to God, not just in praise, but also in our grief and in our anger, too. Because through that way of the cross, God can reach out to us and find our true, authentic, and naked self, and thus heal us and restore our faith. It's one of the lessons that Lent can teach us if we're willing to follow Jesus through these days in the wilderness that stretch between here and Easter. So what does this way of the cross look